So here we have questions for our entire panel. We've covered quite a bit. I'd like to just throw out one question to the practitioners that actually have used the vaccine in the field. Um, when you think about barricade and thinking about going forward, what's the one thing that you're kind of excited about that uh, is in your practice and your clientele? Anytime we have a new opportunity, uh, a lot of things fall in line, I guess, if we can keep person in control, I figure uh, we do a lot of things. So we have another tool in the toolbox. Um, finding the right situation, obviously, where that um, applies. You know, depending on, we saw some differences uh, in some of our trial work and how many uh, old percent positive pigs that we need. And so does that play a role? What's the, uh, where, what's your secondaries look like? Things like that, positioning. But uh, anytime you have additional opportunities to try and combat the virus, it's exciting. Let's open up the panel for some discussion, questions, thoughts, comments. Tim? I don't know, Andy, if you want to take this as a field or Bob, if you want to take this for science. Uh, you know, when we have a, a farm that's months after exposure and we're leaking out of the feral house, piglets are being more negative, we go into a, what we call a rebel, everybody does. Uh, would this have any scientific play to do like day old piglets to try to increase the immunity so when they two weeks later when they're getting first exposure later in the farrowing house, uh, would this help us get through and gravel and get it out of the farrowing house quicker? So either one of you. I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. And no thank you for that. Um, I, 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 I'll be honest, I have concerns about David uh, and his friend You're getting that question. Of, um, um, at this point in time, as, as uh, Brian pointed out, we have data at a week. We know what we know what volume we need. We know what size tip we need. We've done that work to establish that wasn't that, that wasn't established up here. You know how much uh, um, food gets 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 where in the areas and how much gets back to the towns. Uh, at that day of age administration, you simply don't have the data yet. I, I don't know if, if one of the, the cams or Jessica, you want to make, make comment on that. But we don't have that hands-on data with the at that day of age. Anybody else? Andy? We're talking about day one administration? Right. I think we have a study we're working on that uh, hopefully we have some data. A year from now, we might have some new data. Yes, sir. A, a group has been back. A, a group in the field has been vaccinated. We understand that, but we just don't have all the feedback yet on that. That said, that three to five day window, um, I, 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 I know there's also not a lot going on in the in the immune response in that day window, and things start to, to really start to, to 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 kick off between three and five in that three and five day window, and I just think that that's a, a, a better shot. And they, you know, sometimes that pig is zero converted 10 to 14 days of age. So, what would be your optimum time in front of that to, to try to prevent that? I've, I've got a, I've got a real good confidence that, that there's things that are going on three to five days after administration of this vaccine compared to what we see with the normal activated vaccine. So, if, if you can get it in there three to five days of age, I think you've got things going on between um, five and seven days after that. I'm seeing a, a positive nod here that you had experience. You know, just, okay. From what you said earlier, that makes sense. Andy, I don't know if you had to follow up on that. Uh, nothing specific over here. Coming to you. Yeah, uh, does one or two girls elicit a license response? And that would be one question. And then uh, have you injected it on the second uh, dose? And what does that do? Two shots in a lie, so we start to get a little bit of a lie response after one shot. Um, I don't know if we, did, if we have a data set with naive pigs with two shots and following up on the uh, uh, IDG lie I don't know if we have the data set. 
doesn't sound like we do, it doesn't look like we do. And the second part of the question, I'm sure? Uh, I have you injected I am the second book. Okay. It was not routinely not in commercial pigs. It was an experimental group that received a, an I am shot and elicited a strong circulating antibody response. Uh, we didn't take that group through the challenge. So you have not challenged that, that's correct. Questions? Any kind of over there? Questions? Dr. Kerry Sexton. So, Brazil, you talked about a post versus a pre versus post. Can you describe a little bit more what you're doing in those situations? Yes. So, in those situations, we are going to be implementing Actimmune even before we have a break. So, they will always be vaccinated. And that is going along the same lines of knowing that we are most likely sending our negative pigs into a positive environment. I would like them to have some, at least started to stimulate some immune response to it. And then the post break, since we've already done half of that vaccination, if we know that we're breaking, we bring in the second vaccination. And I don't really know that we have fully decided yet as a team whether it's the one in processing that we're going to be doing pre and then adding the one at weaning or if it's the one at weaning since that's the closest to entry into the nursery. So. That would be pretty similar to what we're trying to do on a first break where we're weaning, you know, we're getting down to 30% positive or 20% positive pigs and we're trying to get in front of that where we're going to break in the nursery. <coughs> So you're doing replacement gills when you get them as a weed pig, and are you doing one or two? Both. So our study is going to be replacement gills um, coming into a known positive sow herd. We're going to uh, control one dose and two dose, and then measure viral shedding um, after they're exposed to the, the farm virus. And they're, they're, it's a filtered sow farm with the isolated GT. GDU with its own separate airspace, so we can keep them negative uh, while they build the immune response to that immune before they're exposed. And if Bob or one of you guys, if, if you were giving that replacement uh, female by Christmas doing so into a negative herd and say someday you're going to get exposed to the herds, I'd like to get some immunity in without having a live virus in there, would you? If you're doing it as both well, how big would you recommend doing it again before reading or if you're in that negative situation, certainly the second shot is going to be a lot more effective at giving you the kind of duration that you're going to want to have. So you do the two shot program once you buy you buy it in full pump pay. So you do it there and get two weeks later or and get two and do it right away. Um, too, too close to each other is going to be better than too far apart. And Arthur won't make it through the GDU before they get first. We pretty much know that when they leave the isolation, they'll quickly be exposed. Question over here. Is in your cases, did you do any kind of birth control or not by five times even to the first break? Yes, so our control plan with our three herds out there is all very similar as a Gil EC, MLV, and then you also see MJ and our SAO CMJ. So we did our standard protocol for when we see curves out there when those farms break, as well as prevention for those who need no longer stock field entry. How about the pigs? Any MLV? No, so our piglets do not see MLV prior to leaving the sow unit. Don't do it at the nursery. So we do truly send an unprotected pig in. I've got a question. Knowing uh, you had some good success with barricade purrs that you shared with us today, you know that afternoon is working on a flu formulation, and you soon be working on a combo formulation. What are your thoughts on barricade flu? based upon your experience so far with barricade pillars. I think it makes a lot of sense to, if we can, you know, 
cover both of those diseases at the same time and you know get more out of the, the labor and, and the dollars going into that pig if we're already doing it one and we can stick with a killed product and not have to deal with something live on the first side I think that I mean it's definitely worth a shot to, to see you know how we can control flu from a mucosal side with a killed vaccine another novel approach that really hasn't been looked at yet. And I do also appreciate any product that makes my sow see less injections, even my piglets see less. Steve, duration on uh, flu formulation similar to the making the barricade curves? Yeah, the manufacturing process is very similar. We're still working out some of the dynamic with respect to the, the, the viruses and, and how the viruses are you know, associated with these, these particles. So imagine now you've got, you know, with PERS, we've got one virus, and, and of course we're decorating a nanoparticle with that virus. Now we've got two, three, you know, maybe multiple strains of flu. Uh, and so the, the decorating of those individual nanoparticles and then the reformulation of that and, and making sure that, you know, we don't have over-aggregation of the particles or, or some of the, the chemical, physical properties of the vaccine that we, we have to monitor. So we're, so we're working on the, uh, some of those, uh, those details right now. But I think we're ready to, to proceed. We've got uh, a good collaborator uh, with, with influenza um, to be able to make the, the engine for influenza. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in beginning to look at a formulation, uh, I, I think we're ready to, to, to begin talking about orders and, and proceeding with that. The next step then would be the actual herbs and flu combinations and those that's going to be the more difficult uh, combination but right now we're looking at uh, putting together the first flu monoclonal vaccine and then of course that will immediately lead to something saying can I just put herbs and flu together and that's our ultimate objective. Any other questions? Over here, Andy. About, about the, the swine flu, you made the virus isolation using the CMAX cells or you use another kind of biologic substrate? Yeah, the, the CMAX cell does not uh, support the growth of, of influenza, so very good question. Uh, no, it, it would be just the traditional kind of cell lines that would be used for, for influenza. I'd like to, 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 to kind of bridge a couple of those statements that were just made. Um, one of the things that Atropine has done that not all autogenous manufacturers do, and I would say that most autogenous manufacturers don't do, is to demonstrate that a specific viral mode in a formulated vaccine is associated with protection in, in, in some model. And so before that SIV comes out, the people have demonstrated that that specific viral mode is protective uh, in, in, in a challenge model. As, pointed out, as Steve pointed out, a little bit more work to demonstrate that the combination doesn't interfere. So there's, this isn't your typical, um, simply go up and present it to the, to the, to the term, return to the client. We want to make sure that we've got consistency in, 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 uh, in, in product quality that's going to be able to help be predictive of what's in that, in that, in that control study is predictive of what we'll see in the future. On the nanoparticle technology, are you guys tied to the technology you use based on the regulatory approvals you got, or if there are innovations in nanoparticle technology, can you plug and play fairly quickly with the next greatest thing? So we're collaborating with experts in, in that in that particular field of nanoparticle technology, and they formulated several different uh, nanoparticles that we wrote. Uh, primarily, again, we're dealing with electrostatic and interactions between the nanoparticle and the antigen. Fortunately, most of the viral antigens look like they're behaving similarly with respect to their attraction to that nanoparticle. So the, the short answer is yes, we could go back and redevelop one of the nanoparticle if we thought there was a benefit to it. So far, it appears that for purpose and for the same nanoparticle is, uh, 
is working well. And that, that's actually quite good because if you start, if you imagine you start getting into different charged nanoparticles, and they're going to start interacting more with one another than, than actually with the antigen that you're trying to, to, to you know, adhere to that level. So um, right now, at this point, we don't anticipate that we're, we're going to need to do that. We are working on maybe improving it, not necessarily to change it, but to actually improve it and, and see if uh, if there's a, you know, just a lighter uh, way to, to make the man more. So and after that nanoparticle question, I had a, just a question. Is there any concerns with the farm workers inhaling continually the uh, adjuvants and nanoparticles that are in this product? So that's a really good question, and so the, uh, the components of this uh, nanoparticle, if you will, are, are, are considered to be safe. They're used in many uh, household products <laughs> that humans are exposed to routinely, um, and, and so we, do, we haven't anticipated any kind of uh, you know, uh, unusual kind of uh, response or reaction, and I don't think we've had anybody who has had any, uh, any, any kind of uh, observed effect using them. Product. Most of the product is, is administered into the into the animal, uh, into the narrow animal. So there's not very much, and there's not like a, a spray that actually is uh, presented to the to the administrator. I hope that answered your question. Is there a limit to the number of strains in clinical That's that's always a good question. <laughs> so, number of strains. Is there a limit to the number of strains? Uh, so for what we understand is with who, uh, there's likely going to be a uh, desire to look at multiples, multiple strains. Um, uh, we, we would like to keep that to a minimum, um, but, if, but if the immune profile uh, requires that we have different uh, strains in that vaccine, well, hopefully, you know, once we get a little more data on this and, and similar to what we saw with PERS and you know, the, the ability to have a little bit of protection. You know, I think if, if you're really uh, approaching this from a mucosal immunity perspective and you get broader, uh, broader protection, maybe we don't need to have multiple strains in the vaccine, but we, we still have to answer that question. So for PERS, we're looking at just one in a formulation for flu. We, we'd like to see no more than three. And, that, and I'm not advocating for having three, but if, if, I think we would have to, to limit it there at that three. So are you guys working on a way to um, verify the, the compliance of the vaccination? Because obviously it's not a very easy one to give, and one that you don't get the farm staff to buy on, and you know we can't measure antibodies. It's pretty easy to say, yeah, we vaccinated them all, it's all good. But how are we, how are we really going to know? That's going to be the question. Another really good question, and it has come up, and I have maybe just asked for some feedback on that, because there's two approaches. One is to put a, some sort of a dye marker into the vaccine so that you can at least see that the nostril of the, of the animal has been, you know, affected by the color. The other one, then, is actually looking for an immune response, and, and that, of course, requires you to go out there and take another sample and do another testing and do another the animal. So I throw it out to you, what would you rather see? We do have some flexibility with putting some dye agents uh, into the vaccine or evaluating compatibility with the nanoparticle formulation right now. But if that were to be, you know, an improvement in the vaccine, I guess, would, would, that, would that be something that you would uh, be interested in? In any way to, to verify compliance. It's generally ruled that simple and easy gets done. If it's a hassle, then you gotta start fluid. Yeah. Okay. So a dye type of a nostril dye. Yeah, I mean fluorophores, anything you know, any technology out there that you can think of you to be able to assess that with the dye. Okay. That came that came up pretty early. And when we didn't have any data, we had to do a lot of convincing in these farm staff to actually administer. And they had to work out their process and they did. But after they got on the Barricade program, we went back and checked the data and interviewed the farm staff. And a lot of these integrated systems are able to see that value go through the production line. They, they want to make sure that administration is done. So yeah, as we go further, there's always going to be compliance issues. But right now, we're really on the momentum of wanting to make uh, a new program better. 
So I'm going to end it there because we're still just about out of time. Thank you, panel, for all your hard work today. Let's get our panel.